working. Today I'll be talking about graphics processing units. What is a graphics processing unit? How does it work? Where does it come from? What does it taste like? Just kidding. Next slide. <laughs> a graphics processing unit, or a GPU, is a kind of computing device. GPUs are designed to be very efficient at certain kinds of computing problems, as we might guess from the name. Some of those computing problems are related to graphics. Next slide. While GPUs were developed in order to more efficiently compute graphics-related calculations, GPUs over the last decades have become more widely used across a number of non-graphics-related applications. Imagine a restaurant. The menu in this restaurant is a thousand pages long. <laughs> the kitchen is humongous. The fridge, freezer, pantry, extensive. The kitchen at this restaurant is staffed by only one person, the master chef. No cuisine is off limits to the master chef. Sutherland, we're watching him demo his dissertation, which is a setup that he calls Sketchpad. Sutherland's dream is for the interaction with computers to be more like a dance, give and take, responsive. Now, he builds Sketchpad, and Sketchpad heralds a, a new era, a new paradigm for interactions between humans and machines, centered around the screen. 
This is David Evans. David Evans in the mid-1960s is a computer scientist who gets recruited to the University of Utah to run a new kind of computer science program there, one specializing in computer graphics. Every new grad student recruit to Evans' program arrives in his office on their first day and is presented with a brown-covered copy of Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad dissertation. In 1968, Evans has recruited Sutherland to come join him at the University of Utah. Their headquarters is in the foothills of the Salt Lake Valley in an abandoned bunker at Fort Douglas. From the mid-1960s to 1980, Sutherland, Evans, and their graduate students will be responsible for no less than the invention of the very concepts that make modern computer graphics possible. The graduates of this school over this time period will go on to found Pixar, Adobe, Atari, Netscape. So what is it that they're doing for those three decades? Well, if you are interested in responsive computer graphics in the year 1965, your first question is something like, how? <laughs> like, how do you represent an object in computer code? How do you get that object into a scene with other objects? How do you capture that scene from a certain perspective? And how do you then render that perspective into a grid of colored pixels? For three decades, the team at the University of Utah are just crunching through problem after problem in the sequence, and sometimes the solution takes the shape of a machine, a humongous, atrociously expensive, specialized computer. And sometimes the solution is in the form of a procedure, a certain set of equations or algorithms that, that are the most efficient way to solve that particular problem. In the late 1970s, one of Sutherland and Evans' students is a guy named James Clark, and he finishes at Utah and goes to take a position as junior faculty at Stanford. Stanford's in Palo Alto, very close by the offices of Xerox Park. Xerox Park in the 70s and 80s is just an innovation factory churning out the frothing wave of the future. And in the late 70s, they're working on a project to take those room-sized computers and shrink them down, miniaturize the bits and pieces, and Tetris all the wires and components together, and then literally print them onto a wafer of silicon. Clark hears about this experiment, and he wanders over, and he says, hey, can I play? And what Clark decides to build with this new technology for microprocessors is, in effect, a recapitulation of the previous 30 years of work that he had been exposed to at the University of Utah solving computer graphics problems. He took all those different components, the, the machines and the techniques, and he created them in miniature. In effect, what Clark had decided to do was, rather than build a perfect master chef kitchen, he's decided in advance that he's going to make burritos. And he realizes that he's onto something here. He, he creates what is the first graphics processing unit. He calls it the geometry engine. He decides to found a company based around it. And he's going to call it Silicon Graphics Inc., or SGI. In 1981, he's left his job at Stanford to found SGI. Now, from 1995 to 2002, every single Oscar for visual effects will be won by SGI, from Toy Story on up. But in 1981, before any of that happened, he gathers his seven employees around a table, and he says to them, about it, you've got one card with over a hundred cores on it. Well, what if we parallelize these cards? What if we try to get a cluster of these cards working together? I got another mining rig up and I got all, all three of my rigs stacked up here in a very uh, space efficient uh, way. Um, currently running 858.70s and 458.50s. We're going to be unboxing a brand new GPU for main PC. 
Check it out. The, the old way of solving problems with a computer has been to understand the problem very, very well indeed, and moreover, to know at the very outset just exactly what steps are necessary to solve the problem. And so the computer has been, in a sense, nothing but a very elaborate calculating machine. But now we're making the computer be more like a, almost like a human assistant. And the computer will, will seem to have some intelligence. It doesn't really, only the intelligence that we put in it. But it will seem to have intelligence. <laughs> SGI, Silicon Graphics Inc., is focused on building big machines for big companies. But in the early 1990s, a different idea begins to appear for what GPUs could be. And these aren't machines for rendering Hollywood movies. These are devices for playing video games. And the company at the lead of this wave uh, is a, a company called NVIDIA. Now, NVIDIA gets its start in the early 90s by creating graphics cards for PCs and the uh, inner parts for game consoles like Sega Saturn and 64 and Xbox. By the early 2000s, the company has become successful enough to buy its nearest rival and is shipping tens of millions of GPUs annually. Now, computer scientists start to get curious about these devices. They see these image factories rolling out and they begin to wonder what else could be built in those factories. In 2004 and 2005, computer scientists start to play around with using GPUs to develop a kind of software program called artificial neural networks. Now, the idea of artificial neural networks is nothing new. In fact, in the 1940s, computer scientists started to uh, get interested in the idea of something that they called artificial intelligence. And they had the thought, what if we mimic the structure of the human brain? Now, the human brain is composed of approximately 86 billion neurons. Think of them as light bulbs, turn on or off. And those neurons aren't all connected to some central hub that tells them what to do. They're connected to each other in a network. And they listen to their neighbors to determine whether to activate or deactivate. So the idea was to create this structure digitally. So you would have some kind of an input. And that input would light up a layer of neurons. And then that layer would light up a successive layer, and so on until you reach an output layer that creates a guess, a prediction about that input. So if it, the input's a succession of things, maybe the guess is what comes next. Or if the input's an image, maybe the guess is what's depicted. And you start with labeled training data, which already has the correct answer attached to it. And every time that the network guesses correctly, the connections between layers of neurons are reinforced. And every time that the network guesses wrong, connections are redistributed. In the late 1950s, computer scientists actually get this working on a machine. And there's a lot of excitement about this path forward for artificial intelligence for about a decade. At the end of the 1960s, two prominent AI researchers publish a book demonstrating that there seem to be intractable limitations to this technique, and even worse, there are so many calculations involved in this technique that it would take a computer years just to do the math. And on top of that, it would require volumes of training data that are unfathomable. So the idea of neural networks has moved off of center stage. And people continue to work on it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but this is not the main event of AI anymore. So what is happening 
In 2004 and 2005, when these machine learning researchers looked at a GPU, is that they're seeing that unexpectedly, and not by design, the way that James Clark had arranged all of the problem solving that had been done over a three decade period at the University of Utah for computer graphics problems happens to accord pretty closely with the kind of math that's necessary to train a neural network. So in both cases, you have a lot of math problems that have to get solved before you can move on to the next step in the operation. For an image, you have to render out every pixel before you can then do the next frame. For a neural network, you have to determine the degree of activation for every neuron in the layer before you can go on to calculating the degrees of activation in the successive layer. So it would seem that the underlying architecture for GPUs is a pretty good match for neural networks. But doing that work is a giant pain in the ass. Because GPUs were developed by manufacturers like NVIDIA for graphics processing. You can use them for other kinds of processing, but it's like using garden tools to cook. Like you have to really be an enthusiast to do it. And then on top of that, training data sets, massive training data sets, like say labeled images, are pretty thin on the ground. In 2007, both those things change. First, NVIDIA releases a new API, a new programming interface called CUDA, which is designed specifically to make its graphics cards available to researchers, programmers, who are not doing graphics. The second thing is that in 2007, a uh, Princeton computer science professor called Fei Fei Li begins to collect images from what will eventually be a truly massive image recognition training data set. And she and her team will release that and make it public. And in order to encourage uptake, they create an image recognition competition called ImageNet, which is also the name of the data set. A couple years later, in 2012, ImageNet is dominated by a team that uses two GPUs to train an artificial neural network. That paper underlying the project has now been cited over 100,000 times. And that moment, ImageNet in 2012, is now widely seen in retrospect as the inflection point, the moment where the mainstream of AI research cottoned onto the idea that this convergence between GPUs and neural networks would represent the future of artificial intelligence. Since that time, progress in AI research has largely been characterized by the application of ever larger stacks of GPUs against ever more massive training data sets. In 2012, AlexNet, which is that winning algorithm for ImageNet, that was two GPUs trained on 1.2 million images. In 2020, a neural network called GPT-3 was trained using 10,000 GPUs against a training data set of nearly one trillion words. The cost of training GPT-3 is estimated to have been about $5 million. The carbon emissions of training GPT-3 are estimated to be the equivalent of the lifetime emissions of five automobiles. All of this may well lead us to ask, What's the point of all this? <laughs> In one word, automation. Automation pays for itself within reasonable time. Automation increases efficiency. Workers are upgraded. The emphasis shifts from manual to mental skills. Automation conserves manpower. Automation improves quality. Automation increases safety. While continuous automatic production has not been entirely achieved, some industries are close to it. If you think you are tired of your everyday mundane works, then let the robots take over your job. Say bye-bye to stoplights and traffic signals and say hello to high speeds. The autonomous car of the future will be able to plot a direct course and communicate with the other cars on the road so that as many as possible can fit and keep the flow moving as quickly as possible. There are a number of reasons why one might introduce a new technology to a workplace. Speed, safety, cost savings, efficiency, class warfare. Since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, automation technologies have been introduced to the places of production for the express purpose of reconfiguring the social relations between workers, managers, and owners. 
the Luddites smashed the automated machines of coal-powered looms not because they were against technology in general, they used advanced tools themselves in their work, but because those looms were the symbol of a changing regime of work relations. They were part of and gave a rationale to other changes like the move from wages to piecework and a ban on trade unions. And over and over again, we see similar instances where the introduction of an automated technology to a workplace becomes a means for reassembling the social relations there uniformly to the benefit of capital. But automation doesn't just create space for the melting down of these labor arrangements, it also creates new categories of work, tending to the machines, caring for their needs, filling in the inevitable gaps, and correcting the inevitable errors. Even as our eyes are drawn to the shiny technology, you can bet there will be humans sweating in the shadows. The factories for burritos, paninis, and crepes. Who chops the onions? Who makes the salsa, bakes the bread, mixes the batter? So Mechanical Turk is focused on making it possible for you to encode human intelligence inside a software application. So for a penny, you might pay someone to tell you whether there is a human in a photo. Think of it as micro work. You've heard of software as a service. Well, this is basically people as a service. Now this is uh, very different from the traditional way of organizing people to do this kind of work. This is the speech in 2006 when Jeff Bezos, Emperor of Amazon, announces a new service to the world. Mm -hmm. It's a set of services. This is the speech in 2006 when Bezos announces the public launch of Amazon Web Services, or AWS. Now, you may know of AWS as kind of the plumbing of the internet. It's got these two kind of prominent parts to it, data storage and cloud computing, both of which anybody can access with an internet connection. And over the last decade, that cloud computing has been increasingly based on clusters of GPUs. The overwhelming majority today of artificial neural networks are trained in the cloud. And nearly 90% of those are trained using Amazon Web Services. But just as crucial to that mesh of the GPU and the artificial neural network will be the other service announced on the same day and on the same slide as these data storage and cloud computing capacities, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. The platform connects companies or individuals who have some kind of informational need, like labeling images over here, with humans sitting at computers or mobile devices over there. Fei Fei Li uses Mechanical Turk to build the ImageNet database. As GPU-enabled artificial neural networks have become the most prevalent form of machine learning development, the so-called micro-work popularized by the Mechanical Turk has proliferated across the globe. And what this means is that even as technology companies trumpet their labor-saving automation services like audio transcription, language translation, content moderation, or customer management, their technologies aren't so much saving labor as rearranging who does it. Because behind every machine learning data set and model is an assembly of human workers. In fact, researchers who have dug into tech startups advertising automation technologies to investors I've discovered that in some cases the automation is just fully a scam. Instead of a computer program being able to, for instance, automatically scan receipts to process them for expense reports, the real work, unbeknownst by customers and investors alike, is actually being done by human click workers. And these workers don't see an hourly wage or salary, they don't get benefits, the work is fundamentally unpredictable, and they don't even usually know who they're working for, and when the work isn't crushing or boring. It's often, in the case of content moderation, traumatizing. And yet, organizations like the IMF and the World Bank celebrate this work as liberating 
and promote its integration into the outskirts of refugee camps in Kenya, Uganda, Lebanon, Palestine, and India. It's become a new form of penal labor in Finland. One of the companies doing this contracting describes its mission as give work, not aid. Another calls it the virtual assembly line. When I was doing this research, I thought I was beginning to understand what I was seeing. A, a massive redistribution of labor from the spaces where workers' rights are protected and upheld by regulation and enforcement to spaces where workers are not seen to have rights or where those rights are not protected. Employees are entirely free to dictate the terms of work. And in my mind, I associated the former spaces of labor rights with wealthy countries, and I associated the latter spaces without protection for workers' rights with places where, for example, legacies of colonialism and imperialism had made more people vulnerable to violence and exploitation. Take self-driving cars. In 2018, it's estimated that 75% of automated vehicle training data was coming from Venezuela, which is a company, a country uh, deep in, in economic crisis. Venezuelans may have been happy to have the work, but considering the disparity between the pay and labor conditions for data labelers on one hand and the rewards to a company like Tesla on the other, it's hard not to see this as a form of exploitation. And yet, the ranks of microworkers also include people from wealthy countries who, for various reasons, aren't able to access hourly waged or salary jobs, like people whose disabilities make a nine to five schedule an impossibility, or people, prevalent women, who are responsible for caring for the elderly and children. And also, some people are genuinely choosing to do this work as a hobby. After all, all it takes is an internet connection. It's accessible 24 hours a day anywhere on Earth. And at the same time, there are also people whose livelihoods depend upon this work as meager and fraught as it is. So clip work is both grafted onto existing spaces of inequality and injustice, and it creates them. So on the one hand, it's a profound irony that technology that's supposed to eliminate the needs for humans to do repetitive and monotonous labor so deeply depends upon labor that's repetitive and monotonous. And on the other hand, maybe it's not so ironic after all. The promise of a world where all labor is performed by artificially intelligent machines is an attractive vision. It's a vision so attractive that it's easy to let those ends justify the means, particularly for those people for whom the means are already very profitable. And so long as the marriage between GPUs and neural networks is seen as the path towards those ends, AI isn't making work go away. It's just moving it around. Thank you.